Okay, so to start, I want to talk about the relationship between maps and truth, um, because there's kind of a tenuous relationship here. Maps can be incredibly powerful tools for uncovering deeper trends, but they can also be wildly abused and they can communicate bad information and misinformation and lies. And so being able to distinguish between a good map that uncovers truth and a bad map that leads you to completely false conclusions is a difficult skill to attain, but we will get that from this class um, and with lots of practice looking at maps. So first, to show the power of maps, um, there's this guy here. He was an early epidemiologist. His name is John Snow. Um, he lived in London. And in 1950, or 1854, not 1954, in 1854 in London, in the, in the neighborhood of Soho, there was a really fast-moving cholera epidemic. Um, so fast-moving that it ended up killing about 10% of the population of Soho in a week and lots of other people were sick and it looked like it was spreading to other areas of the city. And so health officials back then were terrified that this thing was gonna kill 10% of all of London. Um, back then, the prevailing theory for why people got cholera or sickness in general was based on this idea of a miasma or a bad air. And so if you read any like um, Jane Austen novels or Charles Dickens novels or anything from the mid 1800s, when people get sick, they get sent away to the country or get sent away to the coast or get sent away to the sea where they can breathe cleaner air. And that was because they had to escape the bad air of London. And so Londoners around Soho all started leaving so they could get away from the miasma that was coming from Soho and then they weren't getting sick. And so people were like, yay, miasma is the main reason for this. But Jon Snow, um, being an early epidemiologist, was really concerned about this because he wasn't fully sold on this miasma theory. He thought that something else must be causing um, people to get cholera. And so what he did as an early data scientist, geographer, detective, is he drew a map of Soho and marked down every place where people died, every house and every building where people died. And so that's what these, these black lines here, this is Jon Snow's map from 1854. So each of these black lines represents someone who died in one of these buildings. And if you notice, most of the deaths happened right here in one specific building and kind of in this neighborhood. And if you look carefully, there's a big dot here that says pump. Um, and that was just the main water pump for the neighborhood. People went down there and filled up their giant buckets of water and took them back home. And that's how they got their water. There wasn't running water. So everything was based on that pump. And so through interviews and talking with the people here, um, doing like early um, shoe leather epidemiology, he discovered that all these people that were getting sick and dying of cholera used that pump, which made him think that it wasn't miasma that was causing cholera, it was the pump itself. Something about the pump was making people sick. And so the pump still exists today because it's like foundational to like epidemiology and public health. Um, it's a memorial to him, there's a plaque on here somewhere. Um, but what he discovered, like through this mapping system, he found out that this was the cause of cholera, that there was cholera contamination in the well that this pump was drawing from. And then he was able to present his findings to different royal societies of science and was able to convince people that cholera was not caused by miasma, but by something in the water. And then that led later to new discoveries in germ theory and other things that like now we understand how people get sick and why people get cholera. And it was all because of a map. Um, which is really cool. So geographers love this story, epidemiologists love this story, statisticians love this story because like it worked. A map helped uncover truth and everything was great. Um, the problem with this though is that maps can also be used in the opposite direction. So this map here, this was in, like immediately after the 2016 election, this started getting shared among um, right-wing um, social networks. Um, lots of my older relatives were sharing this to show the relationship between um, the, the, or the, the distribution of Democrats in the country and crime rates. And so by showing this, they're saying Democrats are criminals because look at these high crime rates and that's where the Democrats are. Therefore, there's a clear connection between crime and, um, and democracy or political party. Um, the problem with this, though, is two things. One... Um, these blue areas are places where like there are more people 
Um, so naturally, there are higher crime rates in cities than in the middle of Iowa. And so it's, in, it's, it's conflating two things that aren't really related. It, this is kind of like the dual y-axis principle of map world. You're taking two things and saying they must be related. And so that's what they're trying to show here in this. Um, when there isn't really a relationship, there's an underlying variable or a lurking variable or an unmeasured confounder called being in a big city, which naturally has higher crime. Um, just because of the cities work of how cities work. The other issue is that that bottom map that shows crime rate or crime rates in 2013 isn't actually showing crime rates in 2013. That is the election results from uh, the 2012 election between uh, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. So that's just one election map compared to another election map. So of course they're going to move together because in general precincts that vote for a president four years ago are going to vote for the same president the next year or the next um, cycle in general, except in swing states. Um, and so that's really what that's showing. So that's like an outright lie. Um, the people who made this figured that out. Like they, the Washington Post actually did an, a fact check article about this meme. And so a new one emerged where instead of showing this time, they actually showed the real crime rate instead of election results. And again, trying to compare um, where Democrats won and the crime rate. But again, each of these bubbles are just big cities. And that's all it is. It's not because um, democratic policies cause crime or anything like that. It's just um, it's kind of the natural effect of having lots of people in one area. And that's what causes the crime rate. Um, and so that's like these maps are wrong, but they're trying to push a larger agenda um, because they're a map and we believe maps. Um, other examples are um, I had you read this article about bot designed maps where it's really easy to just take a map and throw junk data on it and then people will believe it and share it all over social media because it's a map. Um, it can be used for nefarious reasons. It can also just be used with junk data. So you've probably seen things like this on Facebook and other places um, where they'll say, based on search results from Google, here are the most popular whatevers in each state. Um, but often that data is incredibly unreliable. Um, or it could just be completely made up. This is completely made up. Um, you can see, like, sure, Reese's are probably a good candy for people in Wyoming, but they've also got some non-candy things in here, um, like cigarettes in North Carolina. Um, you have Massachusetts doing stuff. Um, so it's a total, like, joke, but I saw this get shared back when whoever made this created it. It was posted on Reddit. Um, as a joke, but then I saw it get shared by like family members and friends and like elementary school teachers and stuff because they're like, oh, look at this. People love candy. And in Indiana, they love mayonnaise. Um, like people believed it because it was a map. So just because it's a map doesn't mean you should believe it. Um, so pay attention to that. Um, some other things you'll often see is um, kind of related to this, where crime rate is really just kind of a measure of population where lots of people live there, and so naturally there is crime. Um, and when nobody lives places like middle of Nebraska here, there's nobody to do crime to. And so like it's very correlated to population density. Often when you see maps, they are really just standing in for population. So there's this comic here that is based on actual data. Um, this is XKCD. It's a web comic that posts kind of statsy, mathy, nerdy things. Um, but it shows three different heat maps of the actual website's users. So you can see there's lots of them in New England, lots in LA, lots up in Northern California, Seattle. Um, subscribers to Martha Stewart Living, same areas. This corner here, same areas. Um, and it's really easy to make that connection and say there must be a cor correlation between all three of these things. When really, if you're counting the number of people using your website, um, and it's like a global website like CNN or something, it's just going to map onto population. Like if there are lots of people in a city visiting your website, there's lots of people in the city in general. And if two people from some county in rural Nebraska go to your website, it's because there are like a thousand people there and it's really just reflecting population. So just because there are points doesn't mean it's helpful. Um, and so don't rely on just having points. Um, one way around that is to use something called a choropleth which instead of showing the points, it, it's like a heat map, but for a map. So a map heat map. 
Um, and so in this example, this is a good example of a choropleth here. This is, there's a website, um, if you click on this link or you go to the presenter notes, press P, you'll see the link here. Um, this is from smokymountains.com. Um, they've run a whole bunch of different kind of resorts here in the Appalachians. Um, this is their, they have an annual map where you can see when the leaves are going to be the best color for leaf peeping and seeing cool leaves. So you can actually move that slider down at the bottom here and you can see um, based on your county when are going to be the peak times for seeing leaves. And this works because like you could theoretically put a point for every single tree in the United States, but good luck with that, first of all. Um, second of all, like just because like you're going from one county in Georgia to the next county south, that's not a giant distance. And so the difference between like peak foliage time is not gonna be huge. And so you can actually kind of do it at a county level or even a bigger level um, and still convey the same information here. So like you can see these different bands here. So like South Pennsylvania, this is October 26th of last year. South Pennsylvania was basically at its peak here. West Virginia hadn't hit it yet, but it was gonna happen in the next couple of days. Um, and that that's a good use of a choropleth um, because Again, trees are pretty uniformly distributed, except over mm, the desert here. Um, and so it, it's helpful. But they can also hide patterns in the data. And this is similar to um, the, the election maps that we were looking at before. Um, one really popular thing to do right now is to say, America is a super red country. Look at how Republican the entire country is because it's basically all red except for these little blue areas on the, on the edges, on the coasts. Um, because if you map this as a choropleth, um, where you're taking every county and looking at either the proportion of um, Republicans that won seats in each, in each county, or, um, so in this one's more shaded, so you can see like middle of Utah here is kind of light, red or pink, California is kind of mixed here. And so it's trying to show some gradient there, but it's still collapsing. Like the issue here is like Wyoming looks like a super red state, but again, Wyoming is like the least populous country or state in the country. And so that doesn't fully reflect the electorate. It reflects land. And so one issue is that land like doesn't vote. It's not how uh, votes are distributed in the country. And so lots of, um, electoral analysts and political science scientists have been trying to figure out the best way to show this concept of land not voting, because this is a very common map here. And this looks like the whole country is incredibly Republican, um, even though most people in the country live in these blue areas um, that are mixed Democrats and Republicans. Um, but in, again, the middle of Kansas, there's not much happening there. So one alternative is instead of um, filling all these choropleths, you can actually um, do points and size those points by population. Again, using the grammar of graphics, we're mapping population onto um, the size aesthetic. And the way this looks, hopefully it's smooth in the YouTube video. It should be smooth in your browser if you're looking at this at the slides here. If we play this, this if we shrink all the choropleths down, let's actually play it, into points, then it ends up looking like this. And so there's a whole bunch of white space over in the West and the Midwest where very few people live. And the dots on the coasts get a lot bigger because that's where lots of people live. So let's do that again, because it's really neat. Um, I didn't make this, somebody else on the internet did. You can see the source in the, in the pre presenter notes here. But the reason we do this is because of the whole principle of land not voting. So watch Wyoming here. It basically disappears, as does Nevada. Utah doesn't, this is Salt Lake County, that's where Salt Lake City is. Um, Provo, where Brigham Young University is, is down to the south here in Utah County. Those are the two most populous counties in Utah. Um, and so watch those two counties, um, they get big. Um, and so you can actually see the, the proportions of these counties by population. And lots of people would argue that this is a much more accurate view of the shape of the electorate, um, instead of looking at the choropleth. Some other alternatives people have proposed are things called cartograms, where instead of uh, sizing by shape and having a whole bunch of disconnected dots, they still want to maintain the land shapes to some extent. And so rather than having a picture like this, this is something 538 does. They have these hexagon tiles for each of the congressional districts, and they try to shape it or position them by state. 
Um, so Florida is down where Florida is, Texas is here, California is here, and that kind of works. Um, but it also looks really weird. Like, good luck finding Wyoming. It's there going up towards Canada instead of sideways. Utah's squished in the middle here. Um, like, it's a really weird map. And so lots of people don't like that because it's, it's hard to follow geographically. Um, this right here is a fun cartogram um, where instead of having the dots be separate and having white space, they wanted to eliminate all the white space. And so they just kind of enlarged all of the blobs um, so everything's continuous or contiguous and touching. Um, but here's like, where's Seattle and Calif like any part of California? Like maybe this is LA or maybe that is like, I, you can't see state shapes anymore except the Great Lakes and Florida. That's all you can really see in that plot. And it's just a blob. But some people like that. Um, the UK has also been working on this. This is um, three different maps from the 2015 UK general election pre-Brexit. Um, this is with the actual uh, parliamentary district. So it looks like the whole country is conservative um, because that's this blue. And so there's like this huge mass right here, except for London down here, which was labor. And then North England, South Scotland-ish here of uh, different labor strongholds. But if you do the weird blobby cartogram here, you can see that these these blue areas shrink because few people live in these areas and London grows substantially and these other cities grow substantially. Um, or if you do the hexagon version of it, um, that's similar, but again, I, I know this is London. These are other places. Um, it shrinks down the conservative hexagons, but that's, that's all you can really see. Um, this is more helpful potentially in multi-party systems because um, if you look here, there was one district that the Green Party won. Um, you can see it here in the hexagon. That's easy. Um, and you can see it here because that blob kind of got moved up. But you can barely see it here. It's just that tiny point. You can't even see that, that green point where the Green Party held on to a seat. Um, and so this map is, is a map. This is a normal like precinct level map. But when you're trying to show like filled values on it, it's not actually that helpful and it distorts lots of the truth. Um, another alternative to this also comes from XKCD. They do serious stuff too. Um, this is his attempt um, at making the 2016 election map. And this is similar to um, that version where it was just a whole bunch of points. But rather than size the points by um, population, um, he included extra little stick figures for population. And so here, this shows that like one person, each, each person here represents 250,000 voters. So you can tell like over here in the West, nobody really lives there. There's four people in Utah. Um, that's a million voters. Um, most people live right here um, and in Florida and in California, and that's pretty obvious. And then they're colored by um, who they voted for, like 250,000 people voted for Clinton here. Um, 250,000 people voted for Trump up here in upstate New York, etc. Um, and this is kind of a different way of looking at that without having the distortion that comes from the choropleths and arguably tells kind of a better story um, than these weird, trippy, lobby things. So that's another cool way of doing it. Um, there's no one right way um, other than don't use precinct level choropleths or even worse, don't use like state level choropleths because um, that's like way not granular and not going to be very helpful. Um, so maps, there are a ton of issues with them when you're trying to tell truthful stories. Don't lie with them. Um, you can accidentally lie when you're filling by different things, so just pay attention to that. The last way you can mess up with maps and accidentally tell lies or maybe purposely tell lies is with the projections of maps. And this is fundamental to all maps, and this is because the Earth is round. And in the videos that you watched for the readings for today, um, there were a whole bunch of different explanations of this. Like essentially, we, because we're on a ball or a globe, if we want to show a map of that, we have to peel off that layer and somehow flatten it. So naturally, we have to cut in different locations or distort different parts of it so that we can get it flat. And there's no easy way to do that. Um, if you click on this link right here, it'll take you to this website here that actually just loops through a ton of different world map projections. Um, and they're all accurate and they all have different reasons for existing. Um, and so if you, it's kind of mesmerizing to look through here and to see uh, all of these different um, projections. 
and they're all good in different situations. Again, there's no one right way to do this, but they're all accurate. Um, the only part that you have to worry about is deciding which is kind of the most accurate and when you should use which. Um, and there's no right answers for those either. So we'll stop it there and come back here really quick. Okay, so projections are something you need to worry about. There are some common ones um, on the course website. I have a link or I have a list of kind of the most common ones that you'll see. This is the, the standard longitude latitude thing. This is what you see on like Google Maps when you go there and zoom in or zoom out, you'll see kind of this. This is the standard like 180 degrees, um, for 180 degrees up and down, 180 degrees left and right. That's what it looks like. Um, it distorts things vertically, like Greenland looks really wide here. This picture right here, the Gall Peters projection, this is essentially the one from the West Wing clip that you watched. Um, this just isn't upside down. Um, and so it's arguably more accurate, especially for um, things around the equator. So if you look at the size of Africa there, it's much bigger than North America. And that's because it is um, in real life. The Mercator projection you see all over the place. It's one of the most common ones. It's also like one of the worst ones um, because like look at Greenland. It is like as big as North America um, and it's the size of Africa. It's bigger than Africa. If you look at Russia, it's like half the world. Um, and that's because the Mercator projection um, greatly over exaggerates things in the Northern Hemisphere. And there's actually like if you study geography, um, there's a whole history of uh, there's reasons for using the Mercator projection that are rooted in like imperialism and colonialism. And people in Europe, which are in the northern, which is in the northern hemisphere, wanted to emphasize the size of their countries. And so like if you look here, Europe is roughly as big as like two thirds of Africa here, um, especially if you include Scandinavia. And that's that's a distortion. That's not actually the case. Um, but to an imperialist drawing a map that looks great and so the mercator projection is everywhere avoid it if you ever make maps um if you ever have to buy a map don't buy a mercator map those are all the cheapest ones on amazon because like everybody uses mercator but like the national geographic they don't use mercator they use something similar to robinson um but not it's called the winkle triple um projection which you can actually use in r as well um, but it's a better more truthful representation of the world than Mercator. Um, my favorite projection is this Robinson projection, um, which you can tell here, it tries its hardest to not exaggerate things in the poles um, and maintain like and not under exaggerate things in the equator. So it works fairly well. One issue is that it does curve things over on the side. So like Alaska looks kind of goofy there um, and Siberia looks kind of goofy over here. And New Zealand is kind of totally a uh, um, diagonal down here, um, but it does maintain kind of better proportions. So if you look here, Europe is no longer the size of Africa. It's the size of like this part of Africa. And so it's a more accurate version of, of the world if you're trying to show the whole world. Um, which one of these is the best? Who knows? Not Mercator. Um, but any of the others, it depends on kind of the story you're telling. If you're zooming in on one specific area, um, you can use a projection that's made for just Australia or just India or just Pakistan or just Uruguay or whatever um, that kind of emphasizes the, the correct geographic shapes after flattening it from the globe. Um, an example of that is with like U.S. projections. Um, there are two common ones that you'll see. There's this NAD83, which is um, basically the GPS system. This is like the latitude and longitude system. Um, this is what Google Maps uses. Um, it comes from, I think, the Department of Defense, their whole satellite system. The Albers projection, though, is more of kind of a, a, a better approximation of what's happening because we live on a globe. And so if you look at the northern border specifically, this goes straight across. And that's because it's following the latitude line all the way across. But in reality, the latitude line is curvy. And so the Albers projection um, does a much curvier version of the, the northern border of the United States. Um, and so this is kind of potentially more accurate, but it's not always the best because if you're trying to show a map of um, Washington state, for instance, in the Albers projection, it is twisted funny um, because over there, like over on the West coast, everything starts curving up. So the Albers projection here is mostly centered on like Missouri and like the middle of the country here. 
And so instead you kind of get weird shapings here. It's not as obvious with Georgia because Georgia is fairly flat here. But if you look at like North Carolina in this, um, it's diagonally up. And so that's, that's kind of weird and off. Um, but if you look at um, the borders, like over here, the top of North Carolina is flat. The, the top of Utah and Colorado and Wyoming, those are all flat and straight. So if you're just zooming in on one state, um, then this kind of projection is probably better. Um, although there are like Albers versions of each individual state. Um, but for the whole country, you probably want to do something like this that shows kind of the better proportions of everything. Um, the way you find these codes, so if you notice down in the captions for each of these maps, I have like this thing called a CRS code, which is sometimes numbers and it's sometimes text. So like this CRS is 54002. The CRS is plus proj equals Robin. There's also a numeric code for it. Um, the way you figure those out for switching the different projections is there's a whole bunch of different websites that try to list all the projections that are known and that people have made. And so any of those three websites will have kind of a, a big list of codes. And so if you know that Mercator is a thing, you can go search for Mercator and find the code for it, and then you can use it in R. Um, if you just want to browse through that list and see what some of the weird ones are, then you can type in different codes and, and see what the projections look like. Um, the most common ones, again, will be listed on the course website on the example page for today where I walk you through all of the code. At the top of that section, I have a bunch of links to um, different projections and kind of the most common projections that you will ever use. Um, these two links here that I include on the side, they're kind of a, a better overview of the geography behind all of these things, the difference between a projection and a coordinates reference system and other kind of geographic elements. You don't need to worry about that for this class. If you're curious about it, click on those links. Um, for the sake of this class, all you really care about is finding a good projection and using that in R to make it look good. Um, we're not very concerned about kind of the actual ramifications of using each of the different ones because we're just trying to draw pretty maps. Um, which of these projections is the best? None of them. Um, they're all good for different reasons. There's no good or bad projections. Um, there's just appropriate and inappropriate projections, except for Mercator, um, which is pretty much always a bad projection. Um, so th those are kind of the, the main guidelines you need to worry about when you're trying to tell the truth with data. Don't lie. Um, pay attention to how you're mapping aesthetics onto the map and choose projections that don't distort the truth either. Um, don't overinflate Europe if you're trying to compare it to the size of, of Africa. Don't do that. Um, so now you're more equipped to tell the truth with maps.